All right, great. So welcome, everybody. My name is Ramo Naidu. Um, we're going to talk about cooled radio frequency ablation for the shoulder joints. I have our fellow with us who's going to introduce himself. I'm Dr. Nixon, Gavin Nixon here. I'm an interventional spine fellow here at Swedish. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Gavin. I'm going to have Gavin do the entire procedure. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a technique as described by Dr. Max Ekman uh, for the shoulder joint. Uh, you can radio frequency ablate this joint, and the three nerves we're going to go after are the suprascapular nerve, the axillary nerve, which are both done posteriorly, and then anteriorly we address the lateral pectoral nerve, which basically innervates the very front aspect of the of the shoulder joint. The suprascapular nerve, as you as you may well know, accounts for about 70% of the innervation of the joint. The axillary about 25%, and the lateral pectoral 5%. So in combination, those three. Uh, will achieve a fairly good result if a patient has chronic shoulder pain. Uh, I typically do this for patients who have uh, adhesive capsulitis, uh, significant shoulder issues where they're not a candidate for a total shoulder replacement, um, or other patients who have chronic pain after rotator cuff repair or whatever else. So let's get started. Um, we've got our view here. We're using a synthetic model. There's a specific view called the Grashey view, G-R-A-S-H-E-Y, to uh, flatten out the glenoid and have an excellent view on the humeral head here. So what we're seeing here is a direct AP view on the table. Uh, what Steve's gonna do is he's gonna oblique 20 degrees towards me on the II. Perfect, and he's gonna bring a caudal tilt on the II about 15 degrees. This is the Gracie view. Uh, so the shoulder surgeons in the world are certainly familiar with this. This is a view they often go after. And what you're seeing here is that that glenoid fossa basically flattens. Um, and, and that's a very nice view. So I think you can all appreciate the, the scapula itself. Uh, what we're going to do is locate the suprascapular nerve, which actually runs from a medial to lateral orientation along the scapula. And the key thing here is to be close to the glenoid fossa, but not too lateral to be in the joint. If we're too medial, what can happen is you can cause uh, a motor twitch. And of course, we don't want to be radio frequency ablating motor nerves. So there's a sweet spot, and uh, we're going to show you that. So Gavin's going to identify these two locations where we place two needles for the suprascapular nerve. And I've actually drawn out on the table where he should be going, so he's just going to mimic that. Let me get a picture here. And Steve, can we collimate here? We're going to save Gavin's beautiful fingers. When he's 83, he'll remember this day and thank me that I prevented his horrible arth arthritis. Perfect. So that's a little bit more lateral to that, closer to the glenoid fossa. Uh, he's getting there perfect. And Steve, can you collimate here the poor man's hands? I, I really, I'm starting to cry. Um, so he's going to get right a little bit stuff. Yeah, that's actually great. So the, the, the unique thing about cooled radio frequency ablation is that you create a nearly one centimeter diameter lesion. So you don't want to be right on the edge of the glenoid. Uh, you basically want to be just a touch medial to that, but otherwise that looks perfect. Um, so let's, let's direct that more medially away from the joint because we don't want to get our needle into the joint. And, and a rough measure of how big the lesion is, do you guys see the hub of the needle or the introducer itself, that circle? That gives you a, size, a, a, a sort of estimate of what the size of the lesion will be. So, if you can be coaxial, that's always you know the money shot. But in this case, you can kind of see how the hub looks over that particular location. So we can pick up everything and move it medially to get over the scapula. And we're basically touching down onto os. Yeah, so if the needle can touch down right at that location, that would be perfect. One of the interesting things about cool radio frequency ablation is that it creates a spherical lesion. So you don't necessarily have to be coaxial. Uh, or perpendicular like you would with traditional RF where, where you make an elliptoid lesion. This is a purely spherical lesion. So you don't, as I said, have to be perfectly coaxial. Your tip can be kind of there at any orientation and you're generally gonna get uh, a very nice lesion at that location. So if you haven't touched it down on bone here, that, that's fine. Uh, hmm. Wants to walk off into the joint. Still haven't felt the awesome. There we go. There we go. That's looking good. If you can just pop it right down there. That's looking great. Yeah, just a touch cephalid. We'll be there. 
And generally, with collimate uh, to reduce radiation exposure. Uh, so the, there are two types of collimation. There's iris or circle collimation. There's also parallel shutters. Uh, that, that's great. There we go. We're getting that hexagonal zeme collimation. You can also do digital collimation with certain new machines. All right. And then with the second needle, he's going to bring that about a centimeter uh, caudal or inferior to that other needle. So a little bit more medial here, more medial. Yep. You, yep, that's good. And as long as your tip just ends up there on the bone, you could go even a little bit more medial. That would be okay. And just a little bit more cephalad and a little bit more lateral. And when you touch us, that would be great. And a little bit more medial. So we're going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, so that's perfectly coaxial. I like that. That's a beauty. If you're touching down an os, I would be very, very happy with that. So that's a great, that last, this picture you had right there, it gives you a good view of that hub and what the lesion would look like. So if you, if you imagine uh, the two, you know, that circle side by side with the other one, are you on os there? Yeah, but not quite yet. Still okay. So I would just go a little bit more uh, superior, a little bit more superior, and then just touch down, just... Pop it right down to bone. And a little bit more medial. That's nice. That's perfect. So that's exactly what the lesion's gonna look like. If you take that circle, put it on the superior uh, needle's tip, you can see that's where the lesion would be. So then what we would do is we'd test. Gavin's gonna go ahead and start doing the axillary nerve while I talk. Um, but what we do here for the suprascapular is test uh, with motor stimulation at two hertz, looking for any uh, suprascapular nerve motor twitch. And if we see that, we would, we would adjust. We would head more, if anything, superior or cephalad uh, to avoid some of the motor innervation because as that nerve comes across, it branches out and you're catching the sensory branches only going into the glenoid fossa. Now, where he is now is gonna go for the axillary nerve. You can see the, the neck of the humerus. That's actually our inferior border where we do not want to go with our needle because what is there? The circumflex artery. Uh, so we want to avoid that. We wanna stay cephalad or superior to that. And where we're going is we're actually gonna to touch on the eight o'clock position of the humeral head. We don't actually wanna be in the middle of the humeral head like we are. So Steve, if you can open up the collimation, just two clicks. And then, Gavin, if you can just go more la lateral with that needle. Yeah. So more lateral than that. Okay, and then just a little superior, but I like how you're on the border, the edge, a little bit lateral to that. Picture? Picture there, Steve. Perfect. So a little superior to that, because you're pretty close to the circumflex artery. Yep. That's fine, you can start there. So the operative here is to get to the mid-axillary line of the humerus. And the, and the way you do that, rather than having to take a lateral view, which is really challenging, because other, you're gonna see both shoulders and the neck, and it, you really won't see it. So the way you do it is basically understanding that the humeral head is a sphere, and you're touching down on the bone, and at that moment you get that loss, you have gone past the equator, so you bring the needle back. So this is a situation where you're gonna know where you are based on feel. Uh, as Dr. Ray Baker used to say, bone is home. So you're using the bone to identify where you are, and then as soon as you walk off that, it's just like walking off a sphere. You're gonna feel that slip, and then you bring it back. Um, so just take that a little bit more superior, so it's okay, but it's a little close to where that circumflex artery would be. Uh, in between those two locations, Yeah, and then just go a little bit lateral so it walks off. Because right now, if you're touching bone, you're not quite to the mid-axillary line. You want to go a little bit further. But don't head no, inferior. Out. Yeah, head, head, if anything, superior there. These are 17-gauge introducers. 
Um, not huge, but not tiny either. We would rather not go into arteries if we can help it. Picture. Perfect, and now he's taking a second needle, and he's gonna, again, do this uh, by placing at one centimeter cephalad to that other needle. And so we're gonna, again, create two lesions here, really ensuring we're capturing the branches of the axillary nerve. It's off there. Great, and then just walk off laterally. So right now he's kind of poking the sphere uh, or the ice cream scoop, and you really want to go lateral here. You'll feel that walk off, go a little bit more cephalad. <clears throat> yeah, that's perfect. And so again, uh, what we would do, check for motors, making sure that we're not seeing any axillary muscle or deltoid twitch than if we don't, a uh, little local anesthetic radiofrequency ablation uh, for two and a half minutes. So that's it, that's, that's taking care of the posterior aspect. You've denervated 95%. I just wanna quick uh, take the needles out here, Gavin. We're gonna flip the patient over. And this is you know, truly how we do it. So patient's gonna stay like so, we'll put this underneath the arm to Make sure it doesn't wobble on us. <laughs> okay, so Steve, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the shoulder joint, just straight AP. Go straight AP and look at that shoulder joint. <clears throat> and take a picture there. We'll see, we'll see how we're looking here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Perfect, so right there, stay there. And then let's do 15 degrees II towards you. Yep, perfect, and a shot there. And now what we're looking is that coracoid process and then 15 degrees towards the head on the II. And if you notice, that in the middle of the screen is that coracoid process. I don't know if someone in the audience or whoever's moderating can point that out, but what you notice here is that the coracoid process is elongating. It looks like a thumbs down. You guys all appreciate that. Um, so let me just highlight what we're talking about here. Shot here, please. Uh, shot there. Right there. That's the coracoid process. And in fact, where my needle's gonna drop is right above that, right in the middle of that thumbs down. So that is what we're elongating by doing cranial tilt on the II, uh, caudal on the source. So Gavin, if you wanna touch down on that. Uh, if you're worried, like, oh my God, I'm going to go into the lung, if you look on the uh, medial aspects, if this synthetic had ribs, you would actually see your, your far lateral to the rib cage and therefore the lungs. Um, this is very superficial. Uh, this may be a few millimeters, especially in an elderly woman where I often do these procedures. Um, so it's important to, to just maintain a grip on the needle. You may need to use a sponge clamp or a needle driver just to hold the needle during the lesion. Uh, what we have here are two millimeter active tips. Really important that whenever you do cool radio frequency ablation, your active tip is below the skin surface. Um, you don't want to cause a lesion or a char uh, at, the, at the dermis. So again, we're using two millimeter active tip. If you're worried that, gee, my active tip is, is coming out, then what you would do is you'd pick up the skin and you would, you would drop your needle angle and get underneath the skin so it's laying flat. And then you ensure that you're creating a lesion underneath the dermis and not causing any harm to the skin. And then if you just go a little cephalad to that, touch down on bone, you'll probably appreciate, Gavin, that it's not too far down to feel that. Awesome. Yeah, and you could go just a, a wee bit lateral to that, it's fine, that looks good. So you can see what the hub, what the lesion would look like. We would just want that to be right in the middle of the coracoid process. And that's it, guys. We burn there, check motors, make sure that's negative. Two and a half minutes, we've now, oh, that is just beautiful. It's gonna make me cry. Good work, Bart, <laughs> well done. Thank you, that's cool to RF of the shoulder, and I'll pass it off to Dr. David for Nimbus. Sounds good. Right. Do you guys have any questions before we get started with the multi-tying RF? Yes, back. 
Thanks for the demonstration. So in your practice, how often do you do cooled RF versus PNS for the shoulder? So did you guys hear that question? Is how often do you do cooled RF versus peripheral nerve stimulation for the shoulder? Not all at once. They might have mic'd off. Yeah. Is there a question for me? Yes. Okay. So the question is, how often do you do uh, cool RF versus PNS for the shoulder? Uh, for me personally, uh, I would say probably 70% PNS, 30% RF. Uh, it's really patient preference. So I explain if they're in the situation where they're basically, you know, they'll call it end stage shoulder pain where like nothing else can be done as far as the surgery. Uh, I'll lay out the options for RF um, and for PNS. And I generally start out with a suprascapular nerve block just to gain some trust, understand their anatomy, see if that gives them any relief. And if so, then we work our way up to RF and PNS. Uh, most patients kind of want the long-term solution um, and so PNS is really uh, palatable. Okay. Are you guys ready back there, Dr. David?